think I'm here for ancient history. <laughs> I, you know, I, I think I was invited because I'm a battle-scarred veteran. I have emphasis on veteran of this uh, fight to get the hyperinflation on healthcare under some kind of control. It's always become an obsession of mine. And uh, I've been doing this for more than 30 years. And actually, our self-insurance plan goes back 40 years. So it's been a long, uh, a long, long journey. And uh, I want to just reflect back a little bit today on, on that journey and then talk a little bit about where my company, Serograph, is. We're about a 400-person company that makes, uh, we're a manufacturing company. You get in your car, we make the dashboard of your car, make the control panel for your Whirlpool clothes washer. Um, and we sell parts to the, some of the biggest customers in the world. Um, We've been self-insured a long, long time, and uh, we have. I followed Quad Graphics, which put in a on-site healthcare clinic about 30 years ago. I was a fast follower, so we've had an on-site clinic for close to 30 years. So um, it's it's a, a long time perspective backwards. And I want to talk a little bit about the present tense of what we're doing today to try to again offset the the hyperinflation in healthcare a little bit about going forward, and I hope the collective efforts of the pioneers in this room, the game changers in this room, uh, are, are part of what the future looks like. So, um, it is, you know, the, I think my overall perspective is that you, know, you think you're going to tackle a problem in, in the business world, and you're going to come up with a solution, you know, whatever problem-solving solutions you use, you think you're going to solve it. Well, I can tell you that Saragraphs has not solved the problem of hyperinflation. We're, we're mitigating it. Uh, we're offsetting it with continuing innovation, but we certainly have not come up with any kind of a permanent solution. So I'll be happy to listen today. I come to these things to learn as much as I do to talk, and I'll be happy to, to listen to what Matt and some of you other pioneers in the room have to say about where we're going. Just let me uh, say first off that we're delivering what I consider to be first-rate health care at Serograph to our, our 400 families. And we're doing it for our, our I do, I'm a big metrics guy. We're doing our metric, and I've been tracking this for 35 years. Uh, it's, we're delivering health care for about 12000 bucks a year. And I was looking, I see uh, the, the cost per employee is roughly the same as a cost per family. So if you look at the, and there's a lot of data on the per family numbers, I think you probably saw Milliman last year said, hey, we just went over 30,000 bucks per, per family. And so we're at 12,000, and probably most employers are on an average of 25 to 30, somewhere in that range for a family, uh, for family coverage inside their, inside their health plan. So we have mitigated it, but, uh, we, we also have learned that there are just some hard realities. And the, the biggest one is that this hyperinflation just isn't going away. Um, the, the, the health costs have been doubling about every eight years. And that's pretty terrifying. Um, we're spending four million bucks a year on health care at Serograph. And if I were at the national average, you know, they're two to four million, we'd be gone. Uh, we're in a very, very competitive industry. We sell parts. They source, they source these parts all over the world. I had plants in India and China, and we went there to get the cost down. That's all sort of turned on its head. Everybody wants, they don't want supply chains 8,000 miles away, so uh, we're not facing the India price and the China price as much as before, but it's still hyper-competitive. You know, I lose contracts for a couple of three percentage points. So if my health costs are out of control, I'm probably not competitive. It's our third biggest cost in our company. Our payroll is about 22 million. Our raw material costs are about eight, and our health care is about four. It's about 18 percent of our cost structure. So, it's a, it's literally a matter of our survival in our country that we have these costs under control. I can honestly say that I don't think I'd be standing here today as the owner of Serograph. Uh, had we not been aggressive and innovative on how we handle health costs. I don't think we would have survived the, the Great Recession of seven, not 2007 to 2009. I don't think we would have uh, survived the COVID collapse of the economy. Testing, testing. Can everybody get it? 
So I'll just go back to that lugubrious note. I, I don't, if we hadn't been aggressive, we hadn't been innovative on, on managing our health costs, like we manage every other cost in the, country, in the company, why, why don't companies manage their health costs as aggressively as they manage their barrel costs, as their material costs, as their IT costs? So if we hadn't been aggressive and innovative, I wouldn't be standing here. I wouldn't own the company anymore because we had a really rough time in the Great Recession. We had a really tough time in COVID. And uh, luckily, our health costs were relatively under control. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had a, a bad run of big cases, and our health costs jumped up to $18,000 per employee from 12. It damn near killed us. So uh, we got it back down to 12 again through a bunch of innovative uh, management techniques, and uh, we got to keep it there. I just, we have no choice but to keep it under control. So that's the hard, the hard reality is that the hyperinflation in healthcare is not going away. You guys have probably seen the news. Uh, 2025, almost every prognostication I read says it's going up 8.5% next year. They talk about inflation being the biggest uh, political problem in the country as, as we have this presidential campaign. I would submit that a big part of that inflationary um, uh, problem is, is the fact that health costs are, are one of the big inflationary ingredients. Um, it's 20, about roughly 20% of GDP now. So if you've got one-fifth of your economy is out of control for prices and costs, it's going to obviously impact the, the overall number. Um, so that's one hard reality. The, the second hard reality that I've come to realize over the years I've been doing this is uh, that, that at the end of the day, private companies like ours in this room, we pay the whole bill. You know, as, as Matt mentioned, about half of the bill is paid by private employers for their own employees. But we pay the, all the taxes in the country come from private companies and their employees. And actually, we pay the, pri we pay the employees so they can pay their taxes. So if you really do a deductive reasoning, um, we pay the full health care bill in the United States. We pay our own half on the private side, and we pay the taxes that pay for Medicare, Medicaid, armed services. So if you think about that responsibility or that burden, we have every reason to be motivated to do what you guys are doing today and try to get this thing under control. So that's hard reality number two. Um, the third one, and I'm, I'm, I've been writing about politics for a long time, uh, in, in addition to economics, and the, the political leaders in the country are not tackling this. You guys have watched the debates, you've watched the campaign uh, pressers and news releases. They're not touching this subject. In my op humble opinion, the biggest economic problem in the country is health costs. It's... Uh, it's causing personal bankruptcies. It's really, it means uh, life or death for some companies. So it's 20% it's, it's, it's of the economy. And these leading lights that want to run our country haven't touched the subject. The presidential candidates are not touching it. The go Governor Evers is not touching it. Attorney General Call is not touching it. So, it's, so what does that mean? It means we got to solve. We got to solve the problem. We can't wait around for a political answer because it is not coming. Now, of course, they're talking about Medicare for all. I would submit Medicare Advantage for all is a better idea, but it's slow in coming. Uh, Obamacare got more people covered. I think we're down to like eight, ten percent uninsured. It was close to that when it started, but it's not solving the cost problem. In fact, if anything, some of those. Uh, those Obamacare exchange prices are, are really high, especially the, the deductibles. So if, if, if the political leaders in this country aren't going to solve the problem, then who is? I think we're looking at us. Um, all right, so I was asked to talk about a little bit about why the, the C-suites in corporations are more involved. And to be honest, I don't really understand uh, why they're not. If it's the second or third biggest cost bucket in your comp company, oh, it's almost dereliction of duty, almost management malpractice to not uh, pay attention to it. So in our company, we, we try to apply the same managerial skills 
uh, our Six Sigma skills, our purchasing skills to healthcare as we do for every other piece of the company. It is so important to us that uh, it's, it's a board matter. We have outside board of directors in my company, really sharp guys, and every quarter there's a section in the, in the board report that talks about how we're doing on managing health costs. So it's, it's a board level uh, matter. It's, it's a number, it's a high, high priority. And, and I talk to all kinds of CEOs. I used to talk to a lot more. I'm a little on the, most of the CEO, my CEO buddies are not CEOs anymore. But when I did, I was always amazed that they had no idea uh, what they were paying per employee. They didn't know the cost. They go, oh, I'm, I'm getting killed by my health costs. Well, what, how much are you paying per employee? Well, I don't know. I don't know. I said, how can you not know? Uh, so I, I would encourage those of you that are in upper management in the C-suites to get engaged. In fact, those are the guys that I like to talk to. I like to talk to the C-suites. And I will say on an optimistic note that a lot more upper managers, executives are getting involved in this in this uh, challenge. So beyond just the, the pure cost side of it on your, on your P&L and what it does to your balance sheet, you know, there are so many positive benefits that come out of uh, keeping your people healthy. So they, you know, a healthy worker is obviously more productive. The morale is better. There are fewer absences. There's more presenteeism. It's just, you want, you know, I was an officer in the Marine Corps, and we wanted our people to be healthy so they could fight the good fight. Well, I think it applies equally to any company, any, yeah, especially a manufacturing company. You know, we want people to be at the top of their game. We want them to be healthy. And of course, if they're healthy, they, guess what? They stay out of the hospitals. What happens when you need a hospital? The meter starts ringing on the cost side. So they sort of go together, you know, and, and uh, the model that you really need in your company, I, I say to my people at Saragraph, we share the cost 75, 25. 75% 75 company, 25% employees. And that's pretty much true as an average across companies. Say, hey guys, we're in this together. I can't manage this from the top down. I gotta do my part, but you gotta do your part. So then we set up the incentives so that our people are fully engaged as consumers. And uh, so for instance, we have a, a direct contract for, for joint, joints, bones. And we get like a 97% compliance with steering our employees to these high, high quality, high value providers. They, they, don't, they wouldn't think about going someplace where they're charging 70,000 bucks when we're buying joints for 28,000. So they're, they're in the game with me as we approach this. And of course, at the end of the day, if I keep the cost down, it helps the company, but it also helps the family. So, uh, so I, I just want to make the point that the C-suite, the executives, need to be in this thing uh, this deep, way deep. And, and, uh, and fortunately, I know a lot of companies that is happening. And I think the evidence of the people here today, this big turnout shows that it is happening in many companies. Let me just talk a little bit, okay, that's looking backward a little bit, a little bit about the present tense. Uh, what are we doing today? We're doing uh, what we've always done. We're still self-insured. Uh, we love our on-site clinic because not only do they catch stuff early, we have a mandatory mini physical for everybody every, every year, including health draws. We always catch a couple of flagrant uh, health problems that we resolve immediately. Uh, we are staying with our a very uh, entrepreneurial, innovative PBM, and they were one of the first to pass along all the rebates from the pharma companies to us. So it's transparent. We get every, all of the, let's put a, a word on it, all the kickbacks from pharma to try to get companies and employees to use their drugs, we get all those, we get all those rebates. We were paying 1.2 million a year before I found this uh, innovative PBM, and uh, we, we're now running about 500,000. That was a huge saving. Uh, we are using direct contracts wherever we can. I mentioned one already. Um, and I am interested, I, I know there are people here today that are doing a, a better job on direct contracting than we're doing, and I think that's part of Matt Ort's game plan, is he's got a lot of dir direct service providers signed up 
we're again talking to Matt. I think he does, he's doing a better job of direct contracting than we're doing as an individual company. So we're going to look hard at that. Uh, I still use United Healthcare UMR for discounts, and one of the things that they do have a lot of market power on the on the buy side, and when when we're out there looking for uh, bundled prices, fixed prices, off times, I hate to say, but the UMR discounts are better than the direct prices that we try to negotiate. Uh, maybe maybe Matt is doing better. Um, we are staying with our wellness programs because we want our people to be healthy. And I, you know, they, the, the, that's one of the, the morale thing. When, when the people in the company know that I give a damn about their family health and we, we, we walk the talk, it has a huge positive impact on, on employee morale and what, how they feel about the company. So it's <clears throat> very typical. I, I, usually I get, People come to see me when they retire, and it's often after f literally 40 years. We have one guy pushing 50, and uh, very often 30 years. So 34, 40-year careers at Sargraf are normal. And I think part of the reason they do that is because they know that the, the C-suite really cares about them and their family, and often it's, it's demonstrated in the fact that we care about their health. Um, so again, my, my note there, and, I'm just supposed to tee up the subject of why the C-suite should be involved. That, that to me, is almost the best one. People will say, John, I don't, I'm not going to miss you, but I am going to miss your health care plan. <laughs> Future tense. We are we're constantly looking for new innovations that will knock down our costs and offset those inflationary pressures that we all face. So as an example, we are looking on these uh, weight loss drugs, the diabetes drugs, we're looking at uh, compounders who take the basic elements to these drugs and put them together at a much lower price than the, the brand name prices. We got a little bit of trouble with legal liability, you know, as to do, uh, if we don't have a doctor prescribing it, we go straight to the compounder, are we in trouble? So we're working out all those wrinkles, but we'll probably end up uh, finding a compounder to buy Wagovi and Ozemp Ozempic. Uh, the one that, uh, that we've been looking at lately, I have a couple of close friends who are CEOs of one company, 75 people, another 55, really sharp guys. They have basically bailed out on healthcare. They've gone to ICRAs, the Independent Coverage HRAs, where they basically say to the employees, and it's now legal, um, hey, we're, we're getting rid of our health plan, I'm gonna give you a subsidy go to the Obamacare exchanges, and you buy your health care. We'll help, it will help you navigate that, so you buy the best plan. But they are so relieved to be out of managing health costs, and they claim to me that they are, that they're actually saving some money. But basically, they've gotten rid of a huge headache. They don't have to worry about catastrophic losses and stop-loss coverage. They're done with it. They're out of the health care business. So I look at that as sort of a canary in the mine shaft. Um, Obviously, there's a lot of people on the progressive side of our political structure that would like to go to Medicare for All, turn this whole thing over to the government. Uh, my, one of my best friends argues it shouldn't be Medicare for All, it should be Medicare Advantage for All, and I'm on Medicare Advantage myself uh, because it preserves competition among the insurers who sell it. It preserves choice for the consumers, so it's a better model than Medicare for All. It'll be part of the debate for the next 70 days as we approach the November 5th election, but we need to talk to our politicians and edu if we end, end up going that way, and by the way, if we don't solve this thing on the private side, private sector side, like we're all trying to do in this room, we will eventually end up with, with government pay. Um, so, um, so we're looking at ICRAs. Um, we did a big analysis of it last year. I'm paying 12 grand per employee. The best, uh, we got a couple of quotes from ICRA, ICRA middlemen providers, and they were running 14 to $15,000 per employee, so it didn't pay for us to make the switch, but we're still looking hard at it. Um, I, I personally would hate to give up the management of healthcare because it's so important to our families and to our, to our company, but I, I like having a direct control over over that, those set of outcomes that come when you're managing your own destiny. Uh, but we are going to look at it. The other thing we're doing is 
uh, raising hell about the, uh, the merger stampede that's going on. Anybody figured out why, why, would two, why would a health company in Wisconsin, Advocate Aurora, emerge with a company in North Carolina, Atrium? You know, I'm, I've been doing management for about 60 years since I ran a company in the Marine Corps. So I've been doing this a long time. And I, and I know that when you've got something that, that's 800 miles, 800 miles away, you're going to have a lot harder time managing it than if it's, if it's near, near and dear. I just don't get the, the argument that they're going to streamline, they're going to have synergies, you know, that's going to result in a benefit. None of them ever promise price reductions, by the way, when they do these mergers. Not, never. It's never mentioned. So I would say to all of you, talk to your... Uh, your congressman, talk to your legislators. Um, the, uh, the Attorney General of Wisconsin has the right to look over these mergers and consolidations, and Josh Call, the AG, has not done it. The Insurance Commissioner has the right to look over these uh, mergers and consolidations because they almost all own an HMO, so therefore it comes under the insurance rubric. Uh, and of course, none of the presidential candidates have done it. The Biden administration started to move heavy heavier on antitrust legislation, a la Teddy Roosevelt back in 1912, but uh, they have not done much in the healthcare arena. So I would, if I were, I'd bring back Teddy and I'd do some trust busting and, and, and bust up these, both the big organizations on both the sell side, the insurance companies, or excuse me, the provider side, and on the buy side and the insurers. Uh, I wrote a column recently saying, hey, you know, if you don't have competition, so we get down to say two, three, four, well, one or two or three providers in any market and just a couple of dominant insurers, uh, and, and so therefore the, the marketplace disciplines are gone. It's either a monopoly, duopoly, triopoly. Well, what, do you, what do you do? Uh, well, I said, well, if you don't have competition, and, and discipline in the marketplace, that we got to get it through government regulation. So I've been pushing for a public service commission in Wisconsin to regulate prices in healthcare. I know it sounds a little radical, but think about the power energy industry. Back in 1911, Wisconsin created a public service commission to make sure the monopolists, the duopolists, and the, public, and the, and the power sector uh, didn't run rampant with price increases. So. I would uh, just close here, because I'm supposed to be the introductory, introduc <laughs> the introducer, um, and ask you to think about changing the character of your activities in this group from taking care of your own individual companies, but also to become advocates for uh, some kind of government help. Either probably on the regulation side would be the best way to go. Let the, let the market stay in place, but, but regulate it. And, uh, so I'll just close on that note that uh, we, we could use some help from the, the government people as we try to move forward as individual uh, companies. So thanks. Uh, thanks for letting me vent.